Cells contrive simple separation of charges, but great things result. Okay. So <clears throat> today is uh, simply a talk about membrane potential dynamics, like the bare essentials that you're going to need so that we can talk about how muscle cells work and how neurons work down the road, okay? And so a lot of what I'm talking about here is going to be uh, specifically geared towards neurons, but in general, the principles will apply to any excitable tissue, okay? Um, so all of this, all, the, the potential, the electrical potential that a cell experiences across its outer membrane, its plasma membrane, is controlled by the flow of charge carriers, ions, either positive or sometimes negative, usually positive. Um, and this flow of uh, ions is dictated by two factors here. Uh, the first the, uh, is the electrochemical gradient that that specific charge carrier is experiencing and the electrochemical gradient is going to be unique for each species of charge carrier. We'll, we'll tease out, we'll define electrochemical gradient, tease out the electrical and the chemical components uh, in, the, in the following slides. The second factor uh, that dictates the movement of a charge carrier through a membrane is going to be its conductance, the ability of uh, the charge carrier to pass through the various gateways, the different channels and carriers. Uh, this conductance is uh, varied by the process of gating, these channels opening or closing. Allow, channels can open and allow passage or close and restrict uh, passage and reduce conductance. Okay? And so when I use terms like potential and conductance and resistance, these are the ohmic definitions, truly the ohmic definitions, uh, meaning V equals IR, uh, potential being an electric potential, conductance meaning <coughs> the flow, the actual physical flow of a charge carrier, all right? And resistance being the resistance to that flow, overcome by the potential. Um, all right, so in terms of conductance, this gating, uh, any channel can have three, there are three potential states. Not all uh, channels are going to have all three possible states, but there are three possible, uh, the, these are the totality of the, of the possibilities that are, are out there. So the first is a gate is closed, but it's active. All right, that means that uh, it it can open in response to its trigger, and the trigger being a change in the membrane potential. All right, so this is, uh, oh, I'm sorry, yeah. what did I say, open? I meant closed, closed but capable of opening. I think that is what I said. Closed but capable of opening. So it's activated, uh, or it's, pardon me, it's, it's not inactivated, it is uh, not open but able to open. This one is open, it's fully activated, uh, and we get conductance. So no conductance here, conductance through this open activated channel. And this is a channel that is closed and inactivated. All right, so there's a second gate, this inactivation gate uh, on the cytoplasmic side that restricts the flow, okay? And for this, uh, for this channel to be reset, we're going to have to return the membrane potential back to uh, the resting state, the resting potential. And we'll talk about how that happens. These are three uh, gated channel states, closed, uh, but able to open, actually open or activated, and then closed uh, or inactivated. All right. So <clears throat> the electrochemical gradient. First, the electrical gradient. This is an easy one to understand. Uh, any, any child who's ever played with magnets 
knows that opposites attract, opposite magnetic poles will attract. And so uh, the electrical gradient across a membrane, it's just like a battery, too. Um, it's exactly like a battery, where you have an accumulation of negative charge on, on the um, anode and the accumulation of positive charge on the cathode, right, on, on the negative and plus sides. So in a cell, we have all of these acidic amino acids that ionize, that are ionized, and so they're at their conjugate base, and they are negative charge carriers as part of these giant proteins, which are not able to pass out of these channels, out of these carriers. They're sequestered inside the cytoplasm. There's a tremendous amount of negative charge that is, uh, that the membrane is impermeable to. It's sequestered and captured. Then, if you embed proteins in the membrane who use ATP, the energy of ATP, to pump the counter uh, cations to these anionic charges on the protein out, we're going to get a separation of charge. All right, so we're using ATP to pump the counter cations to these anionic acidic um, amino acids. We're going to pump them out of the cytoplasm. And this is going to establish an electrical gradient. This electrical gradient, all these, all these positive charges hanging outside here, they feel it. They want to get back. They want to get back home. There is an electrical gradient pushing them inside. There's a, an electrical potential making them want to go back into the cell. All right? So this baseline electrical potential is called the transmembrane potential, or the symbol we use is V sub TM. And V sub TM can, can change. It can change. It can vary. So the V sub TM will change. Sometimes you see an E rather than a V. Okay. The chemical gradient is, should also be uh, simple for you to think about. So if I had all of the students packed <coughs> over to this side of the room, and I said, you guys wait over here, and I left the room, you are all fairly obedient students, I'm imagining. But with time, if I, if I stayed away long enough, you would begin to meander over here. Okay, or let, let's not even imagine you guys. Let's imagine a room full of first graders. We stick all the first graders, and with time, they would diffuse out into the entire room. Nature abhors a vacuum. That's what a chemical gradient essentially is, all right? So with a chemical gradient here, let's look at um, let's look at sodium, right? There is a higher concentration of sodium on the outside than the inside. Forget about their ch its charge, all right? There's just more of them over here than over there. If I were to open a hole in this membrane, some of them would be traveling this way, some of them will be traveling that way but there's more of them on this side to travel this way than there are to travel back, okay? So with time and the stochasticity of diffusion and movement, more of them are going to go this way until there's an equal number on this side uh, as to this side so that the, the forward and back passage are the same. Does that make sense? That's a chemical gradient. So the chemical gradient is unique to each of the individual species. The electrical gradient that potassium feels is going to be the same as the electrical gradient that sodium feels because they have the same charge. All right? In terms of their electrical charge, they are identical. However, in terms of their chemical identity, they are different. They are different. And they're going to feel different chemical gradients. There's more potassium on the inside, so its chemical gradient is have, wants it to go that way in this cartoon. 
You guys capiche that? Pretty basic. This is this is basic chemistry 101. All right. So <clears throat> how do we establish a baseline uh, transmembrane potential, or what we're going to call the resting potential, the V sub R, the resting potential. This is the potential of a cell that is not going through any kind of process. It's undisturbed. In neurons, most neurons, not quite all, but most, uh, that potential is minus 70 millivolts. How do we do that? How do we do, yeah? Uh, in a non-excitable cell like those ha also have a negative gradient, in, uh, negative uh, transmembrane potential, right? Mm -hmm. And is that like usually similar to that or is our uh, neurons like especially polarized? Neurons are particularly polarized. Yeah, it's it, the transmembrane potential in a fibroblast is definitely not negative 70 millivolts. Okay? Uh, so here <clears throat> we establish this negative 70 millivolt uh, potential. When I was talking about the electrical gradient, I had that little lightning bolt with the ATP. It is ATP. It is the power of hydrolyzing that phosphodiester bond uh, in the phosphate, uh, the third phosphate of ATP, uh, and liberating ADP and pi, there should be an inorganic phosphate here, it's that energy that drives this protein, the sodium-potassium uh, exchange pump, the sodium-potassium ATPase. What this does, the sodium-potassium ATPase is what's called an antiporter. So you can have uniporters, and I cut this slide out, I probably shouldn't have. You can have, here's a membrane, you can have, and here's a channel, here's another channel, and here's a third channel. Uh, you can have a uniporter, which things pass in one direction through. You can have a symporter, in which two things pass together through it, and maybe one's negative and the other's positive, so there's a net charge neutrality. Or you can have uh, antiporters, in which two things pass in opposite directions. The, uh, the sodium-potassium ATPase is an antiporter. And what it does, using the energy of ATP, is it's going to pump three sodium out of the cell. And it's going to bring two potassium back into the cell. All right? So there is a net efflux of positive charge in the terms of sodium. All right? And you can see what this is going to do. This is going to set up sodium with a chemical gradient pointing inward and potassium with a chemical gradient pointing outward. All right? Meanwhile, there are these leak channels that allow the, the potassium to come back out, go down its chemical gradient, and likewise for sodium. The relative expression patterns of these are, are going to be what help us establish that uh, baseline resting membrane potential. Cool? You with me? So this slide here I'm, is, is one of the central ones. So let's make sure we understand this slide. Th and I, I want you to get that this is totally qualitative. This slide is totally qualitative. I'll show you the quantitative way, uh, I'll show you the equation for the quantitative way to determine membrane potential in a moment, but this is qualitative so that you can begin to understand what's happening, okay? Let us consider potassium. Keeping in mind the sodium-potassium ATPase and what it does, what it's been doing for us. So the sodium-potassium ATPase has pumped all this potassium into the cell right here. Its electrical gradient wants the potassium to come inside, right? Because there's all this negative charge built up on the proteins inside. And as a cation, as a positive charge, it wants to come into the cell. So its electrical gradient is, is pointing inside because it's a positive charge carrier. But its, its chemical gradient 
wants it to go outside because there's a lot more potassium inside than outside. You follow that? All right. So the net forces on diffusion adding the, the pressure from its chemical gradient and the pressure from its electrical gradient is a, a modest net outward chemical gradient. All right? If we were to throw open the gates, gated channels that allow potassium, uh, potassium efflux, then it would follow this net gradient until its opposing forces, the chemical gradient, uh, and the force of the chemical gradient was equal and opposite to the electrical gradient. All right? So we're going to relieve that chemical gradient a little bit. It's still going to be there. The, and this is going to drive that membrane potential to minus 90. It's going to drive it to minus 90 because notice what's happening. Potassium is leaving the cell. Potassium is leaving the cell, all right, and it's putting more negative, more positive charge outside that cell, and more uh, leaving a greater unsatisfied negative charge inside the cell, all right. So it's driving it from minus 70, hyperpolarizing it, making it a stronger, a slightly, slightly stronger electrical gradient of minus 90. This is the equilibrium potential for potassium. And, and because I want to go quickly, I'm not going to ask you, I'm going to tell you why, what the reason for this is. It's the sodium-potassium ATPase. The sodium-potassium ATPase is pumping potassium inside so that its chemical gradient will drive it outside. All right? And then when you release that pressure, the chemical and the electrical gradient balance. It's been hyperpolarized. Okay, that's cool. We'll, we'll keep that one uh, in the memory banks. We're going to use that. We're going to use that. On the other hand, let's consider sodium. Here we are with all this sodium outside. Well, its chemical gradient clearly is pointing inside because we're pumping three sodium out for every two potassium in. So there's a, a large accumulation of sodium outside the cell. And in fact, when I say large, this is so that you're understanding the concept, but truly the absolute concentrations of internal and external sodium are very, very close to one another. The variations in these are, are, are quite small, okay? Um, so don't, I mean, this is a cartoon, right? So you can understand it qualitatively. Uh, there's, there's excess sodium outside, and the chemical gradient wants it to come inside the cell. Uh, the electrical gradient is pointing in the same direction. It's pointing in the same direction. Why? Because it's a cation. It's a cation. It's a positive charge carrier. It wants to get closer to the sequestered anions, the sequestered negative charge along its electrical gradient. So, the two of these reinforcing gradients, the, the chemical gradient is reinforcing the electrical gradient to bring uh, the electrical chemi electrochemical gradient to be quite uh, relatively large, pointing inwards. So if we now throw open the gates and let as much sodium flood the cell as we want, this large-ish chemical gradient is going to begin to relieve itself to the point where it's going to flip. It's going to flip the charge, the potential difference. The negative terminal on the battery is going to become positive, and the positive terminal on the battery is going to become negative. It's going to flip uh, to the point where that chemical gradient now is balanced by this uh, opposite electrical gradient and there is no net force on the sodium. So as many sodium can go in as can go out. This is the resting potential, or not resting, pardon me, bad word, equilibrium potential. This is the equilibrium potential for sodium. Now we have something. Now we have something because we have two 
small monovalent cations that are controlled by the, the same antiporter ATPase, but have opposite charge uh, equilibrium potentials. We're going to use this. Okay? We can this can be the spring. <coughs> this can be the spring to set off some sort of membrane action, and this is going to be our reset. So we can do it again. Alright? So the stage is set. We've got resting potential, we've got equilibrium potentials. Now we just need to put in place one last piece, and that's these gates, chemically or electrically gated channels that are going to allow these events to happen. All right. So, and, and, and I mentioned this. We, you know, you, you can spend a whole class, and if you want to, you can take. Uh, one of the upper-level neuro, neuro, neuroscience classes with Josh or somebody, uh, Dr. Martin, and he'll go through all this. But uh, this is the, uh, yeah, the Goldman-Hodgkin-Katz uh, equation. And for determining the, the transmembrane potential at any point in time. So this, these are just some constants, the ideal gas law temperature, Faraday's constant, and then the natural log of this uh, quantity, where you have these terms, uh, which... This is the concentration of some monovalent uh, anion, no, cation, pardon me, that's outside, plus its permeability, the permeability. That means how well is it able to pass, its, you know, essentially its conductance uh, through the membrane, plus uh, the anion that is opposed to it, the concentration of the anion on the other side of the membrane. That's the numerator, and then the denominator is the contrapositive terms. So permeability and concentration of that, of that anion, and the sum of those. So when you, when you extrapolate that to sodium and potassium with chloride, uh, th this is what that, this is what that uh, equation becomes. And you can use this beautifully, quantitatively, uh, to determine what that membrane potential is at any point in time. The guy in the middle eventually won the Nobel Prize, uh, although it wasn't for this work. All right. Oh, you know, I wanted to make this point here, and I, maybe I didn't. The, the membrane potential <coughs> is determined by any ion with the greatest permeability. So that, that's the key. If we want to change the membrane potential, we're going to change the permeability of that membrane to one of these ions that has a rest and equilibrium potential closest to the potential that we want to go towards. All right? So the membrane potential is going to be dictated by the ion with the greatest permeability. Does that make sense? If we're not allowing potassium to flow, but we are allowing sodium to flow, we're going to head towards its equilibrium potential and vice versa. Okay? So we just need to get individual uh, gates that are going to control each of these different uh, ions, and then we'll be able to control the membrane uh, potentials. Okay. Uh, yeah, and that's these gated channels. All right, so a, a gated channel... Uh, are going to open and close in response to stimuli. There's three types. Do I have that? Yeah, okay. The first here is uh, the chemically gated channel. And this is going to be uh, important in uh, graded potentials in the neuron, neuronal cell, uh, cell bodies at the dendrites. This is going to be uh, important at the neuromuscular junction in muscle cells. Um, so, for example, here this would be a muscle cell you would have uh, the acetylcholine receptor, this is a cholinergic receptor, acetylcholine gets released, binds, opens this baby up, and it passes right through. And if you look at uh, one of these membranes, this is what they look like from, from the top down. They look like these uh, sort of spring-loaded uh, structures, interleaved spring-loaded structures that are triggered by acetylcholine. Uh, there are also these voltage-gated channels, and I already showed you this cartoon on the side here where we have 
uh, <clears throat> we have the activation gate and the inactivation gate. This is channel closed but receptive, uh, opens in response to the, to the uh, membrane potential, and then you reach a certain potential and the inactivation gate slams shut on it. Um, yeah, so what's the point here? These voltage-gated channels, are, you're going to find them in axons, which means they're going to give rise to um, action potentials, whereas the chemical gating uh, is going to be graded potentials, and we'll hopefully get a chance to talk about that in the end of class here. Uh, and you'll also find these voltage-gated channels in uh, muscle cells, in the sarcolemma, uh, etc., which we'll talk about in that chapter. The last is mechanically gated channels. We'll talk about these a little bit when we, when we talk about the uh, special senses like um, hearing and the vestibular cochlear system uh, and various touch receptors as well. Uh, you deform the membrane and, and the channels open. Um, okay, so just a few uh, definitions. Depolarization is a, a decrease in the transmembrane potential. That is moving from the resting potential of sev negative 70 millivolts towards zero. Okay, that's a depolarization. That should make sense. Okay, that's like political utopia. Republicans and Democrats holding hands, picking daisies together. Hyperpolarization is moving away from that. Uh, it's an increase in the transmembrane potential that would be moving towards the equilibrium potential of potassium. Uh, so away from minus 70 towards minus 90, a further polarization. Graded potential. There are two essential concepts yet that I have to give you today, and there's a, a lot of other interesting stuff that I, I probably won't get to, but the two essential concepts are the difference between graded potentials and action potentials. Graded potentials and action potentials. Uh, and if I can't fit it at all in today, we'll, we'll cover it, we'll finish it up on Monday. But uh, graded potentials, they are local. They are localized potentials that uh, decrease in intensity of, uh, in, in terms of their uh, distortion of the transmembrane potential away from the site of initial stimulus. So you're going to have stimulus at the membrane somewhere, you're going to have depolarization, and the magnitude of that depolarization is going to get smaller the further away from that point of stimulus you, you were on the membrane. I'll have cartoons that'll help with that in a moment. Um, and, and it says here, any stimulus that's going to open a gated channel is going to produce a graded potential, all right? Be it chemical or electrical, what have you. So we're going to go through it in step by step. Here we are. Uh, this is some portion of the cell body, all right? And we have all this sodium out here, minus 70 millivolts. Uh, some kind of chemical comes in. Let's just call it, gosh, I don't know what it is. It's just some, it's a neurotransmitter. And it opens up these chemically gated uh, channels. And the sodium starts flooding in because its electrochemical gradient wants it to go in. Both the chemical and electrical gradients want it to come in. All right, and we start uh, depolarizing, moving from minus 70 towards minus 65. So now we get these local currents. The sodium that's flooding in begins to diffuse out through uh, the cytoplasm. And it is going to change the, uh, so this is still gated here, I guess. But it's going to change, it's going to spread out, this local current is going to diffuse out from the initial site of stimulus, the epicenter of stimulus, uh, and it's going to change the membrane potential away from the open gates. All right. Let's, let's look at what this uh, means here. So uh, a depolarization in the graded potential, this is 
a, a rapid shift away from uh, the resting potential caused by the flow of sodium in this case. It causes a local current and a depolarization. So we're going to draw, this is the membrane here, and this dimension is uh, depolarization. All right, depolarization. So here I am at negative 70, and I'm going to go up towards zero. And I, I drop my acetylcholine on the membrane here. It causes a, an extreme depolarization here, and then the local currents of sodium that flood the uh, cytosol around that site cause uh, a local depolarization in the membrane nearby, but it dissipates with distance. It dissipates with distance, okay? Because there are no voltage-gated channels in the membrane here. Yes, Jacob? Yeah, so it's, uh, like, it's in an extreme case, there's one uh, channel that opens up that's chemically gated that lets in some sodium, but then that sodium, if it doesn't simulate an action potential, it just sort of spreads out, and then uh, there's only that gradient there. And that Absolutely. That's going to go... Away. Absolutely. Yeah. As soon as the, the chemical uh, trigger diffuses off of the channel, it, absolutely. This is an analog signal. This is an analog <coughs> amplitude encoded signal, an amplitude encoded signal. So how much chemical, how much neurotransmitter did you dump on the membrane here? Was it a strong reaction? Is that going to spread out further? Or was it... Uh, a, a weak release of neurotransmitter and only a few channels, and it would be a, a, uh, a smaller uh, response. This is an analog uh, signal. What, so action potentials are digital, uh, and, and the information is frequency encoded rather than amplitude encoded. Now, potassium on the other side. Uh, when you have a graded potential that is dictated by potassium dynamics, this is going to be a hyperpolarization and a shift towards negative 90 millivolts. All right, so we're dropping potassium or neurotransmitter on uh, the membrane here, opening up potassium channels, and potassium uh, floods out. We're going to uh, have a negative, uh, a move towards negative 90 millivolts, and it's going to dissipate with uh, proximity to the site of stimulus. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that would be something like an inhibitory signal from another neuron? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I unfortunately cut out all that stuff at the end of this lecture, but that's exactly what that is. Absolutely. Um... So this is just sort of a, a, a recapitulation of the same idea. Um, uh, so we have the stimulus here, and it's going to spread out from the site of that stimulus and dissipate with distance, okay? Dissipate with distance. We are changing uh, the, the, we are changing the, the current, the uh, ion current, through the cytoplasm at the site of stimulus. Uh, is there any other point that I need to make? So it's a passive spread. Um, yeah, I've made all those points. I've made all those points already. So let's, I should just cut that one out. The other hand is action potential. I'm, I'm probably not going to get a chance to give this its full due here. Um, we'll, we'll, I'll probably pick up on Monday a little bit of time. Um, so an action potential, on the other hand, is a, a large, rapid and reversible, and importantly, propagated uh, depolarization of the transmembrane potential, okay? So, if it, so it can only happen in what's called an excitable membrane, an excitable membrane. Over here, this membrane is not excitable. I can cause a depolarization, but it's localized. This membrane over here, it, it, you can perturb it, but you're not going to get it to do the same thing. It's not like a row of dominoes. 
okay? Whereas with an action potential, it's like a row of dominoes. If, the, if we get a, a depolarization anywhere on that excitable membrane, you're going to get it everywhere on that excitable membrane. Yes? So does the excitable membrane like start at the axon hillock? You got it. Absolutely. <clears throat> so <clears throat> this is the process by which a neuron, for example, is going to connect uh, some sort of transmembrane event, you know, a bunch of graded potentials here that are able to <coughs> add up. We have enough graded potentials coming into these dendrites which add up and are going to trigger an action potential, as uh, he points out, at the axon hillock. It's, it connects events at the soma with uh, synapses at the, at the end of the telodendria. Okay, and I'm, I'm just going to go through the, the basic steps of this, and I'll let you out. This will only take about a, a minute. So, um, we start at the resting potential. And I, we don't have the sodium-potassium ATPase. We don't have the pore channels. I'm not depicting them, but they're here. I'm in, depicting the important parts for the action potential. We have the sodium channel with its activation and inactivation gates, and the, and the potassium channel, which is also gated. Let's see what happens. So we have a local current coming in from some graded potentials that happened nearby, but, or enough of them added up, so that a local current gets to a point where the membrane now is excitable. And once this happens, it's the all or none principle. The all or none principle. If you're going to start this, you can't stop it. You can't have like half an action potential. You start the dominoes falling, they're all going to fall. So if we get to the point where we open one of these gates, this is going to start the process. This gate's going to swing open. Sodium's going to flood in towards and drive the membrane potential towards sodium's equilibrium potential, which is like whatever that was, minus 33 or plus 33 or whatever it was. Plus 66. Oh, plus 66, thank you. Um, so they rush in, and uh, this membrane potential uh, changes. Oh, this is why I was thinking 30. At plus 30, however, this gate slams shut. So he's right. The equilibrium potential was plus 60, but it doesn't get there because at plus 30, this gate closes. And the potassium gate opens. The inactivation gate for uh, sodium closes, and the activation gate for potassium opens up. And now sodium can't flow any longer. It can't go in and out. But potassium can. And now we're going to head... It, now potassium is the ion with the greatest, greatest perme permeability. We're going to head towards its equilibrium potential, which was minus 90. All right? And this is repolarization. It all floods out, uh, and we get to minus 90. This is, these doors switch. Uh, the potassium, sodium channel is now reactivated, and the potassium channel closes. All right? So there you go. That's an action potential. Uh, I will I'll clean up the loose ends. There's a couple loose ends uh, that, that the quiz kind of ate into, I guess, today. But I'll get them on Monday. Um, that's that. Any questions?